personality theory. The first of the modern personality theories was developed by Sigmund Freud, and it is known as psychoanalytic theory. The psychiatric practice of this theory is called psychoanalysis. Freud's ideas were many, and his theory about personality has had a lot of influence on societies around the world through many different disciplines, apart from psychology, which has been influenced and reformed by his ideas. We have literature, art, philosophy, cultural studies, film theory, and many other academic subjects. Freud's theory represents one of the major intellectual ideas of the modern world. Whether right or wrong, these ideas have had a lasting and enormous impact. To understand Freud's theory of personality, we must begin with the concept of unconsciousness. This is the cornerstone idea in psychoanalytic theory. Freud believed that most behaviors are caused by thoughts, ideas, and wishes that are in a person's brain, but are not easily accessible by the conscious part of the mind. In other words, your brain knows things that your mind doesn't. This reservoir of conceptions of which we are unaware is called unconscious. Psychoanalytic theory proposes that personality characteristics are mostly a reflection of the contents of the unconscious part of the mind. Pushing things down. Freud believed that the unconscious is a part of our biological nature and that it operates naturally, just as we do, uh, just, just as all our biological functions. Freud suggested that certain ideas and thoughts are repressed, that is pushed out of awareness and into unconscious. This happens according to Freud's theory. When these ideas and thoughts are threatening to us, repression works like our immune system. It protects us from dangerous things. In the case of personality, dangerous things include anything that threatens self-esteem or feelings of, com uh, of comfort and pleasure. When we have thoughts or ideas that are threatening, they are pushed out of consciousness because awareness of these ideas produces anxiety. They make us feel nervous. Dreams and sleeps. Although repression keeps undesirable information in the unconscious and out of awareness, that repressed information is influential, and according to Freud's theory, it can seep out of the unconscious and express itself through behaviors, thoughts, and dreams. Unconscious thoughts express themselves in a disguised form so as not to overly disturb the conscious mind. It is as if the unconscious is a boiling cauldron of threatening and anxiety-producing ideas, but the steam from this boiling pot can filter up into our awareness and influence our behaviors and haunt our emotions and cognitions. Freud proposed that the best place to look for clues to the unconscious is in dreams. A dream, Freud said, is a disguised form of what we unconsciously wish for. Dreams are wish fulfillment. Through them, we get what our unconscious wants, but dreams are not obvious. They are not direct mirrors of unconsciousness. A dream must be analyzed and interpreted in order to understand the clues that it provides. Sometimes, according to Freud, a mistake is not a mistake. Just as a dream, uh, as dreams have hidden meaning, some mistakes have hidden meanings. When we make a mistake that is influenced by the unconscious, which is a mistake, is not a mistake. When a mistake has a meaning, it is called a Freudian sleep. For example, a sleep of the tongue. If you accidentally call your boyfriend or girlfriend by the wrong name, it might just be a mistake, but it might be a Freudian sleep. That is, it might be a mistake that reveals something about your unconscious thoughts and wishes. If a person has done something that he believes to be wrong, perhaps he told a lie early in the day, 
and this act has made him feel guilty. Then perhaps later while peeling potatoes, he might unintentionally cut himself. Freud said that sometimes such an act is no accident. The feeling of guilt in the unconscious might have directed the person to cut himself as punishment for his lying. Remember, it does no good to ask the person whether this is true. Freud theory says that this information is in the unconscious. A person is not aware of it. In fact, during therapy, Freudian psychoanalysts believe that if a patient becomes upset when a therapist suggests that there is a particular thought or wish in the person's unconscious, this might be evidence that the therapist is on the right track. In psychoanalytic theory, this is known as resistance, referring to the idea that patients will resist suggestions that probe the anxiety producing contents of the unconscious. The unconscious wants to keep those thoughts from awareness and become upset when they are approached. One of the techniques used in psychoanalysis is to analyze the patient's resistance to see what clues it might provide regarding the person's unconscious thoughts. Theoretically, the stuff in the unconscious is there because it is bothersome to the person. The mind actively represses the information, whether that is rational or not, Freud's view is that repression might be harmful and might be the cause of patients' mental or behavioral symptoms. Freud's cure is to reveal the unconscious information. If a therapist suggests that a patient's problem might be connected to his relationship with his uh, relative or, and the patient screams, leave my relative out of this, the, psycho uh, the psychoanalytic therapist use this response as indicative of repression and resistance and a signal that therapy should proceed in that direction. We have personality structures. Freud suggested an analogy about the mind. He said that the mind is like an iceberg in the ocean, floating 10% above the water and 90% below. The unconscious, Freud proposed, makes up the vast majority of our mind. In Freud's view, only 10% of our behaviors are caused by conscious awareness. About, about 90 are produced by unconscious factors. According to psychoanalytic theory, most of what controls our behaviors, thoughts, and feelings is unknown to our aware mind. Normally, the unconscious guides us. Freud said that the mind could be divided into three abstract categories. These are the id, ego, and superego. Although these are known as structures, don't take them literally. Freud did not mean that these are physical parts of our bodies or our brain. He coined these terms and proposed this division of the mind as abstract ideas meant to help us to understand how personality develops and works and how mental illness can develop. So the first is the id, id, I do, Latin for the term it. This division of the mind includes our basic instinct, inborn dispositions, and animalistic urges. Freud said that the id is totally unconscious, that we are unaware of its working. The id is not rational. It imagines dreams and events things to get us what we want. Freud said that the id operates according to the pleasure principle. It aims towards pleasurable things and away from painful things. The id aims to satisfy our biological urges and drives. It includes feeling of hunger, lust, sex, and other natural body desires aimed at deriving pleasure. The ego, Greek and Latin for I, this personality structure begins developing in childhood and can be interpreted as the self. The ego is partly conscious and partly unconscious. The ego operates according to the reality principle. That is, it attempts to help the id get what it wants by judging the difference between real and imaginary. If a person is hungry, the id might begin to imagine food and even dream about food. The ego however will try to determine how to get some real food. The ego helps a person satisfy needs through reality, the superego. The term means above the ego and includes the moral ideas that a person learns within the family and society. The superego gives people feelings of pride when they do something correct, that is the ego ideal, and feelings of guilt when they do something they consider to be morally wrong. The superego, like the ego, is partly conscious and partly unconscious. The superego is a child's moral 
parameter and it, it creates feelings of pride and guilt, uh, uh, guilt according to the beliefs that have been learned within the family and the culture. Freud theorized that healthy personality development requires a balance between the id and the superego. These two divisions of the mind are naturally at conflict with one another. The id attempts to satisfy animal biological ideas while the superego preaches patience and restraints. The struggle between these two is an example of intrapsychic conflict. Intrapsychic conflict. Conflict within the mind. According to psychoanalytic theory, defense mechanisms are automatic and conscious reactions to the fear that the id desires will overwhelm the ego. Freud believed that a healthy personality was one in which the id demands are met, but also the superegos is satisfied in making the person feel proud and not overwhelmed by guilt. If the id is too strong, a person will be rude, overbearing, selfish, and moralistic. If the superego is too strong, a person is constantly worried, nervous, and full of guilt and anxiety, and is always repressing the its desires. A very strong id makes one a psychopath, lacking con uh, lacking a conscience or an uh, conscience or an ogre, a selfishly meeting one's needs without concern for others. A normally strong super ego, on the other hand, makes one a warrior, an erotic, so overwhelmed by guilt that it is difficult to get satisfaction. Sometimes you say that the ego is the mediator between the id and the super ego, but this is not what Freud said. The ego does not help to find a compromise. The ego helps the id to satisfy its desires by focusing on what is real. Then the stage, the stages. Freud theorized that personality traits evolve through a series of stages that occur during childhood and adolescence. These are called psychosexual stages because they focus on mental psych ideas about sex. However, it is important to note that Freud's language was German and not everything from German translates precisely into English. When we say that Freud's theory concentrates on sex, we are using the term in an overly broad manner. There is no word in English for exactly what Freud was talking about. Sensuality might be closer than sex to the concept that Freud had in mind. Freud was referring to everything that gave a person bodily pleasure. In psychoanalytic theory, sucking your thumb is part of sex. Massaging your neck or your ears is also included. Freud believed that these pleasurable activities of the body were instinct instinctually inborn, were instinctually inborn, and that they were often frowned on by society. The sexual activities that were most disapproved of were repressed into the unconscious and therefore were more likely to influence personality. Freud proposed that personality traits arise at certain times of our lives. For, for instance, dependency on a personality trait that arises during childhood, when the child is very dependent on others. In a sense, Freud suggested that the seed of adult personality traits are planted during childhood. The particular thing that happens to us, those things that were repressed because they were sexual or traumatic, are retained in our unconscious and thereby sprout up as adult personality characteristics. These seeds of our adult trade were planted during psychosexual stages, according to Freud. The adult personality, according to Freud, is a reflection of the contents of the unconscious. The unconscious is the reservoir of important things that happened to us in childhood. Biological urges, drama, uh, trauma, sexuality, aggression, and other incidents that were ex repressed provide the impetus for certain personality traits. According to Freud, psychoanalytic theory, or an adult personality trait is a throwback to some unconscious urge, such as the urge to gain parental favor. If too much or too little satisfaction occurs during childhood, uh, childhood stage or if a traumatic event occurs during the stage, when a person will, then a pa the person will exhibit personality traits consistent with that stage. This is known as fixation. We say that a person with babyish traits such as dependency on biting 
or, or chewing or his or her fingers is fixated in the oral stage. According to psychoanalytic theory, the roots of personality are found in childhood. Freud's psychosexual stages. The first one is oral. The first stage in Freud's theory covers babies up to about the age of one and a half years. The driving force during this stage is interest and pleasure in activities involving the mouth hence the term oral, such as sucking and biting. Adult oral personality traits that de derive from the oral stage include anything to do with the mouth, such as smoking, overeating, or biting the nails, and anything that is babyish, like uh, being naive, swallowing anything you are told, or being independent on others. Then the anal stage, the second stage is the anal stage. This stage centers on toilet training, beginning around the age of 18 months to 2 years, and extending up to preschool, about age 3. The term anal, of course, refers to the anus, the rare end, the opposite end of oral. And one of the jobs in psychology is that you can't spell analys anal analysis without anal. This joke makes light of the fact that Freud believed this stage to be crucial in planting the seed of for a number of adult personality traits. In the anal stage, the child is being toilet trained and is learning to hold in and let out at appropriate times. Therefore, Freud proposed that personality traits related to either holding in or letting out were formed during the anal stage. The following traits are, are known as anal retentive, that is finding pressure from holding in. They are neatness, orderliness, punctuality, cleanliness, compulsiveness, perfectionism, and stinginess. The, f uh, the following are called anal expulsive, that is finding pleasure from letting out, being undisciplined, being messy, disorderly, late, impulsive, and overly generous. The dark stage is the phallic stage. This stage occurs approximately during the preschool years. The term phallic, phallic means any representations of the penis, which, according to Freud, is the main occupation of the unconscious, uh, unconscious during the childhood years of about three to six uh, years among both girls and boys. It is at this stage, theoretically, that children become aware of whether or not they have a penis, and Freud believed that this cause causes a bit of anxiety in there unconsciousness parts of the mind boys freud reasoned become protective of their penis and the fear be having it taken away this is known as castration castration anxiety and it might be manifested in a young boy's fear of knives scissors or being bitten by dogs girls freud thought feel resentful that they do not have a penis and hence seek phallic things and activities that will provide them with feelings of power and possession. This is known as penis envy and might uh, might be seen when preschool girls develop a deep fondness for horses uh, or strong, anything strong, masculine things or long-pointed uh, objects. Freud proposed that Freud proposed an unconscious drama during this stage that he called uh, his most important idea. It is called the Oedipus complex, sometimes referred to as Oedipal conflict. This unconscious process is named after the Greek story of Oedipus, the man who was raised by foster parents and grew up to unwittingly kill his biological father and marry his biological mother. Freud said that a similar drama occurs in the unconscious minds of preschool boys who favor their mothers and fear their father's um, father's castration, which is castration and anxiety. The child resents the father for getting all of the mother's attention. Many psychoanalysts suggest a similar conflict for preschool girls referred to as the electro complex. It is essentially the reverse of the situation for boys, love and desire for father, resentment for the mother. According to psychoanalytic theory, these complexes complexes become so severe and anxiety producing that the child's unconscious must revolve, uh, resolve them 
using a defense mechanism. The solution is for a child to begin to identify with the same sex parent. Yes. The child begins to internalize the personality of the same sex parent, thereby relieving the anxiety and the vicariously winning the love of the opposite sex parent. For a little boy, being like daddy means no longer having to fear and resent him. And it also means getting ma uh, mommy's love through daddy. For a little girl, it means winning daddy's love by being like mommy. This process is called identification with the aggressor, sometimes simply known as identification. The, the result is that children begin to internalize the values, morals, and morals that the super ego trails, attitudes, and behaviors of their parents. In fact, in 1925, Freud concluded that he had been wrong about penis energy in young girls and theorized that the audible struggle for girls as well as for boys centered on love for the mother. This remains a controversial idea among psychoanalysts. The fourth stage is the latency stage. After resolving the audible conflict through identification at about age six, children enter a stage during which sexual urges are dom dormant and resting. The term latent means that something is present or has potentials without being active or evident. During this stage, sexual urges are taking a, a recess. They are at a minimum. From about the ages of 6 to 12 years, boys typically stick together and say that they do not like girls or they act squamishly around girls. Similarly, girls during this stage are highly critical of boys or shy around them and avoid them. Apparently, the demand for of the previous stage that and the Oedipal drama was so overwhelming that the unconsciousness a bit of arrest. The next stage is the genital stage. This is the final of the psychosexual stages, which arises during the adolescence when teenagers begin again to show sexual interest. This stage leads to adult affection and love. If all has gone well in the previous stages, Freud theorized interest during adolescence is on heterosexual relationship. This is a time of exploring pleasure through more mature love and affection. Psychoanalytic theory is not totally a scientific or empirical theory that can be tested or to determine its veracity. It is probably best to treat psychoanalytic theory as a series of interesting stories with the plots and characters. Whether these stories are good or not depends on the extent to which they provide a deeper and better understanding of human personality development. Some of Freud's concepts have met that test. For example, the unconscious repression, the importance of childhood sexuality, and the influence of parenting on the, on the child's personality. It is hard to deny the basic tenets of psychoanalytic theory. The unconscious can influence our behaviors and our personality. Things that happen in childhood plant the seeds for adult personality development. Traumatic events in childhood can have lasting effect on our personalities, and the sexual drive is an important factor in our lives that can influence our personality. On the other hand, many of Freud's ideas are not supported by research and observation. His theory provides some provocations, uh, provocative ideas about the course of human development and the causes of behaviors, but this often fails when put to empirical tests. Now, defense mechanism, that's what we call mental uh, protection. Psychoanalytic theory suggests that there are other ways in which our unconscious protects us from, besides being, uh, besides protects us besides repression. These protective devices of the unconscious are known as defense mechanisms. At the center is the unconscious and its biological drives to protect us from what is threatening. Defense mechanisms protect us from anxiety and threats. In that sense, they are useful and good. However, they can go too far and take us into abnormality. When defense mechanisms become extreme, they cause more problems than they solve. A person might then develop symptoms of mental disturbance. Freud proposed a clinical therapy to, te to deal with these instances, as we, as we have noted earlier. The essence of this approach is to reveal 
reveal the contents of the unconscious to the patient so that he or she can see that there is nothing to be afraid of. Let's look at some of those defense mechanisms. The first one is rationalization. Rationalization. Sometimes our unconscious makes up it makes up a good sounding reason to explain something we did we don't like. If we fail a test, we blame it on others. If our favorite candidate doesn't win the election, we say that it is for the best anyway. If we don't complete an assignment, we think the teacher was unfair to have given the assignment. Sour crepes in, in brackets is another example. If we don't get something we want, we find something wrong with it and convince ourselves we are better off without it. Rationalizing protects us from the anxiety of seeing ourselves as deficient. This is a common defense mechanism because of the importance placed on giving good reason for things. However, this is a rational. It is, uh, yeah, this, this, is, this, this, this is not rational. Rational has to do with thinking. It is rationalizing. Being rational means being objective. In rationalization, our minds protect us with a reason that only sounds good. It is not objective. It just seems to be. Our mind is trying to help us out. The next one is projection. In this case, when we have something, uh, some thoughts or feelings that we consider to be wrong or upsetting, we project them on to other people instead of ourselves. If I believe that a certain attitude or feeling that I have is terribly wrong, I will claim that others have it. A person who wants to use illegal drugs but who believes that it will make him a horrible person might expect everyone else to want to use illegal drugs. This defense mechanism reflects the anxiety, uh, deflects, deflects the anxiety away from us and unto others. One of the predictions that a person makes about someone else are in fact true about the person making the prediction. Be careful what you say about others. It might be true about you. If a man says that he believes people lie on their uh, on their date of birth when they were born, the year of birth, perhaps it's an indication that he has he he lied himself when he was getting his ID. We have sublimation as the next. We supplement we supplement if we redirect or rechannel our undesirable emotions and thoughts into a socially acceptable activity. If I I am full of rage and horrible thoughts, I might vigorously wash my car. Many people supplement by pouring their emotion into work of art. The famous painter Vincent Van Gogh is the example that is most often given. His mental and emotional uh, distress seem evidence in the vivid colors, thick paints, and forceful brush strokes of his painting. We can imagine Van Gogh's moods merely by looking at his paintings. Many famous composers and poets also are good examples of this defense mechanism. Their mental anguish is a redirected into wonderful work of art. There is a long list of composers and poets who suffered from depression and bipolar disorders. That is a tragedy, but one that provides us with a world of music and literature. So through sublimation, unpleasant mental energy is redirected into acceptable work. The next one is reaction formation. Sometimes people's mental and emotional energy is so threatening that they adopt the reverse the opposite of what they really want. A person who believes that drinking alcohol is a terrible sin, yet who has a desire to drink alcohol might be protected by reaction formation. In this case, the person unconscious adopts a hatred of alcohol. The person might join groups that protest against uh, alcohol use and might attempt to pass laws against drinking alcohol. The person becomes very critical of alcohol. We might say, If a man believes that being gay is a, her a horrible thing, yet feels attracted to other men, he might express a deep hatred of for gays and attempt to hurt to hurt them. 
in reaction formation, a person unconscious takes on the belief that are opposite of true desires, those repressed in the unconscious. This protects the conscious part of the mind from what the unconscious considered to be uh, awful. Then we have displacement. Freud suggests that defense mechanism, this defense mechanism explains how a person's unconscious wishes will appear in dreams, but in disguise. A woman who is angry with her brother Tom my dream that she harms, uh, she harms a noisy tomcat. Her unconscious will, her unconscious, will not be aware of the connection between the names. Her anger is displaced onto a symbol of her brother. This defense mechanism is often used to explain behaviors outside of dreams. For instance, when a person's dis, uh, person's displeasure is directed towards some object other than the source of the of the displeasure. For example, if an employee displaces his anger towards his boss, onto his wife, a sub or onto a subordinate or onto an animal like a dog. Then we have denial. The defense mechanism is a, a primitive form of repression. In this instance, a person simply denies things that produce anxiety. The term is often used today in referring to people who have obvious problems with alcohol, drugs, or relationship, but refuse to accept that those problems exist. Regression. Under conditions of severe trauma or stress, a person might revert to developmentally earlier forms of behavior and thinking. This is known as regression. A person who is under significant stress, for example, might begin uh, sucking his or her thumb. Freudian theory argues that regression provides a person with feelings of security and calm when under threatening conditions. Then we have new Freudian perspectives. Freudian's ideas have been controversial. The new Freudians differed from Freud on a number of issues. Some of the key theorists who are inclined in this category include Carl Rogers, Carl Rogers, Karen Honey, uh, Karen Honey, and uh, 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 and Ad Alfred Adler. So, Carl, not Carl Rogers, sorry, Carl, Carl Jung, Carl Jung, Carl Jung, eighteen seventy-five to nineteen sixty-one, was one of the first prominent analysts to break away from Freud. Carl Jung worked with Freud in the early years of his career, and everybody knew this was a disciple of Freud who will carry after the Freudian tradition. But Jung saw human as being guided much by aims and aspirations, not just as by sex and aggression. So to distinguish his approach from classic psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis Jung named it analytical psychology. Jung, 1951. A basic assumption of his theory is that personality consists of competing forces and structures within the individual that must be balanced. Unlike Freud, he emphasized conflict between opposing forces within the individual rather than between the individual and the demands of society or between the individual and reality. Jung was opposed to the central role of sex and aggression in human life. Instead, of, instead he proposed that people are motivated by more general psychological energy. He proposed that the deepest part of one's psyche comprises the collective unconscious. It is a set of influences inherited from our family and the human race. The collective unconscious contains archetypes which are the mental images of a particular person, object, or experience. Hero, powerful father, innocent child, uh, nature and mother are examples of archetypes. Then we have uh, Karen Honey, who comes up with basic anxiety. Karen Honey, between 1885 to 1952, was another disciple of Freud who developed a theory that deviated from basic Freudian dis uh, principles. Honey adopted a more optimistic view of human life, emphasizing human growth and self realization. She calls concentrated on early childhood development and her work formed the basics 
of much later work in this area. One of Honey's major contribution was her challenge to Freud's treatment of women. She countered that in the early part of the 20th century, women were more likely to be affected by social and cultural oppression than the absence of a penis. Honey emphasized on the importance of social relationship in personality development. Basic anxiety refers to the feeling of a child of being isolated and helpless in a potentially hostile world. Alfred Adler, feelings of inferiority and superiority, comes up with that. Adler proposed that the central human motive is that of striving for superiority. It arises from feelings of inferiority that are experienced during infancy and childhood. During this period, the child is helpless and depends on others for help and support. The psychoanalytic ideas have been criticized on the ground that uh, there is inadequate evidence to support the theory. With all that said and done, we can look at the strength of the psychoanalytic theory and then we look at the limitations and how we can use make of the psychoanalytic theory. So the strength of the psychoanalytic theory, among many other things, is that they view that uh, it is the view, it is the view that some of our behaviors is influenced by motives of which we are unaware. Psychoanalytic theory suggests that personality is determined by past and present experiences, and personality can be better understood by examining it developmentally, but only if the approach takes into account the reality of the human person, intelligent and endowed with the willpower and able to correct character deviations from possible neg negative childhood experiences. It is not beyond this human ability to do this. Emphasis on conflict and anxiety imply the need to examine one's own dark side of things and recognize that adjustment is not always easy, but it's possible. Among others, those are just but few. Limitations, psychoanalytic concepts are not easy to research on as it is difficult to translate them into testable hypotheses. One of Roy's theories, fundamental defect, is the evaluation of the observation according to previous device schemes. Therefore, one is not working scientifically, but simply constructing hy hypotheses upon hypotheses. The concepts are inferred and interpreted rather than tested or observed. How can we make use of like analytic theory, like analytic, and that's the application? We should find out as much background information on children as possible as this may help them, uh, may help us understand them better. We try to understand, you also we try to understand ourselves, uh, try to understand yourself to maintain your mental health and ensure healthy relationship with children, parents, and other teachers. Be warm towards children and provide love and affection to facilitate healthy personality development. Encourage children to express themselves, their feelings and concerns so that they can reduce anxieties and discomfort. Let children know that feelings are natural and others experience such feelings, among others. How can we help children avoid fixation during the oral stage? Press feed the children and, don't, uh, and do not win the child too early. So that the child has adequate time to form strong attachments and bonding with you. This helps the child to develop trust uh, in self and others and the world around them. At the annual stage, start training the child when you observe that the child is ready, he or she can follow instruction and has a language to be able to express his or her need to go to the toilet. Do not be too strict during toilet training and accept accidents as a matter of fact. If you train the child too early or if you become too strict, the child might develop feelings of guilt and fear of soiling self as he or she grows up. So gentle correction helps will help the, the baby. Phallic stage, avoid punishing the child for touching his or her sex organs. Asking questions about sex organs or showing curiosity such as if they too are like him or her. Keep the children busy with activities and play materials. So give the child enough attention so as to divert the child's interest in touching sex organs, although this is a rare tendency. Tell children that we 
cover our sex organs and take good care of them because they are very important. Latin sisters, let children engage in play and activities with children and other children of the same sex. Encourage children to work hard in academic work and give them responsibilities. Children take a lot of pride when they do well in school, participate in games and sports, and are given other responsibilities. Genital stage puberty marks the entry to adolescence. Hormonal changes experienced during adolescence lead to maturation in sexual characteristics. New sexual feelings emerge, and the adolescents need to develop physically, mentally, and psychologically. Parents and teachers should understand that adolescents are given are again searching for um, adolescents are again searching for self identity. They want to be independent, but at times they are also dependent. Parents and teachers should know when adolescents are just asserting their independence and when they are rebellious and disobedient. Adolescents need to build healthy relationship with peers of the same and opposite sex. Good relationship with others and their understanding and support will ensure uh, adolescents build mature, healthy, love relationship and to function independently as adults in society. Thank you.